Last time we talked, we saw a TV preacher tell somebody that as long as you pay God his 10% protection money faithfully and without fail, everybody in your family will be healthy, rich, and good-looking. What do you think? Is God really that fickle? Hi, I'm David L. Washburn, and this is Bible Insights. Last time we established that we don't do tithing in the New Testament and beyond, we do freely given offerings. So how does that work? Well, the definitive chapter on this is 2 Corinthians 9. But before we dig into the passage itself, we need a little background. Paul and his team have been traveling through what's known as Greece today. Back then it was two countries, Macedonia and Achaia. Paul has been going from town to town, starting in the synagogues and preaching first to the Jews, and every time they reject him, he turns to the Gentiles and finds a ready audience. As he rolls into town, he meets Aquila, and since Aquila and his wife Priscilla are tent makers by trade, Paul joins them and supports himself for a while. He's come to Corinth in advance of his team. They're still tying up loose ends in Athens after Paul presented Christ to the philosophers hanging out on Mars Hill. As quick as his team arrives, Paul quits making tents and devotes himself to preaching full-time. He starts a church there, gets in trouble with the city officials, and then moves on. But the church he left behind was definitely unique. They just couldn't seem to get it together. And when Paul wrote them a fairly nasty letter to correct all the weird stuff they were doing, they apparently looked at it and said, Why should we listen to him? He's not a real apostle. He doesn't have any authority. That's why Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. Basically, he's telling them, yes, I am in fact an apostle. Yes, I do have authority over you. And yes, if you don't start straightening some things out, you are going to be in big trouble. One of the things he tried to correct them on was the subject of giving. How fickle were these guys? Look at this. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints. This service that he's talking about is part of his big money collection for the poor in Jerusalem. He's been to Corinth, he started the church there, he's seen it turn into a raging disaster, he's done what he can to try and straighten them out, and now they're the next stop on his money collection tour. He told them about it, they know he's coming, they agreed to collect a certain amount, they know when he's coming, and he expects them to have it ready for him so he can just pick it up and keep on moving. And he trusts them to do that, right? For I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this manner should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Did you catch that? I know you guys are going to do this. I've been bragging to all the other churches about how good you guys are at giving. Nothing like a little peer pressure to get people on the stick, right? But it's worse than that. He actually says, I'm sending the team in advance of my own arrival to make sure you're actually doing this and you're not just all talk. I don't want you to be ashamed when I get there and it's not ready, so they'll help you get everything in order, make sure it's where it's supposed to be, and then we'll all be good to go and you guys won't have to be embarrassed. Isn't that great? He can't just ask them for the gift. He has to manipulate them into doing it. He says, I know you guys. You promised X, but that may or may not happen before I get there. So I'm sending my point man ahead to make sure everything is in order. That way it's an actual gift and not something I have to force you to gather up while I'm there because that could lead to hard feelings. And we sure don't want that. 
He goes on and gives us a little dissertation about cheerful giving, talks about how God is faithful and will always make it possible for you to do something when it's needed, however large or small. He then talks about the purpose of this giving. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. People will give thanks to God when they see your generosity, when they see that you're actually practicing your profession of Christ. That's an offering. And that's why he says a few verses earlier that offerings are to be given freely, not grudgingly or out of necessity or compulsion. So wait a minute. What's the definition of a tithe again? The tenth part of agricultural produce or personal income set apart as an offering to God or for works of mercy, or the same amount regarded as an obligation or tax for the support of the church, priesthood, or the like. So a tithe is basically an obligation, or a tax if you will, to support the church, or the priesthood, or whatever. In the Old Testament, it was basically a tax to support the priests, the Levites, and the poor. But here, Paul says there is no obligation, we're to give freely. But again, what's the purpose of those offerings? Feeding the hungry, clothing and sheltering the poor, looking after those who need it in the name of Jesus. And why do we do this? Because when they see us giving so freely, not just to each other, but to anybody in need, they want to know what it is that motivates us to do that. They look at our joy in giving and helping and say, I want what they have. And we have a field ripe for harvest. Now, what happens when we take the opposite approach? when we start attaching strings to the help we give people. If you use drugs, you get nothing. If you have a child and you're not married, you get nothing. If you curse in front of us, you get nothing. If you're not part of our little circle, you get nothing. If you smell, you get nothing. If you're in the country illegally, you get nothing. What's that? You have a child who's hungry? Well, you should have thought of that before you swam the river with her. And if we say, oh, it's okay, I give my 10% like I'm required to, so I'm all right, they're just going to laugh. Seriously, people see that kind of attitude and they see us as a bunch of self-centered hypocrites. What do they think when we have a cow about paying our taxes to cover social programs that help the poor? If there's one thing we know for sure about Jesus, it's this. He cared about people more than he cared about his own life. When we take such a callous attitude toward people who are hurting, hungry, in need of shelter or medical care, they see us for exactly what we are, phonies. We talk a good Christianity, but when it's time to put your money where your mouth is, oh no, I'll do my tithe, however much it annoys me, and then I'm good. No, you're not. And unchurched people can see that you're not, and when they look at what you claim to have, they want no part of it. So what's the deal with tithing? Here's a summary. The Old Testament included several types of tithes, not just one. The purpose of the tithe was to provide sustenance for the temple assistants and priests as well as the poor in the land. Some tithes were to be brought to the temple, others were eaten by the bringer as an act of worship. All tithes were to be shared freely with those who needed something. Failure to bring tithes was not an important matter to God when it came to sending his prophets to warn the people about their errors. We only see tithing at the temple mentioned in the New Testament before Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' resurrection eliminated the need for the temple cult and hence eliminated the need for the tithe. The New Testament pattern is offerings, not tithes. There is no set amount. Each is to give based on their own conscience. Tithing is not a New Testament concept, and anybody who tries to guilt you into tithing is selling something you don't want. Let's face facts. There are plenty of church members in this country who could easily give half their income and never feel the pinch. Why don't they? Because they don't want to. 
How selfish are we? Well, have you ever pondered the question of whether you should tithe on your gross income or your net income? If you have, or you know somebody who has, ask yourself why that question came up. If it's really giving freely the way Paul described here, then the question isn't, how much do I have to part with? But, how much does this person need and how close can I get to it? We will give you 10%, 50%, 20, 40, 30, 25. Ah. Now, if you're comfortable doing the 10% thing, and it seems to be what you can do without hurting your family, go for it. But be aware of a few things. First, you don't have to. Nothing in the Bible requires you to do it. You're not required to do anything. So if you get into a pinch and can't do it for a week or a month or whatever, don't fret. God isn't going to take away your brownie points or give you leprosy. If there's a certain time when you want to give and can't, find out what else you can do. God just wants to hear from you. He doesn't care about the numbers. He cares about you. Get closer to Him. Get on more intimate terms with Him. And then just listen. He has ways of making it clear what He wants you to give and to whom. And that's the bottom line here. Tithing is legalism. Jesus doesn't want that. He wants you. So get to know him. Train your heart to see the people around you the way he does. And your giving will sort itself out because you'll be more tuned in to the needs around you. From there, the possibilities are endless. Just listen and give when he tells you to. No percentages, no obligations, no punishments, not even a little Paul-style manipulation. Just listen. Get to know the Lord, and your giving will fall into place, and you'll probably find yourself giving more and in more ways than you ever imagined possible. Thanks for watching. I'm David L. Washburn, and I'll see you next time.